Okay, we're going to get started. Ch- sixth chapter of, of uh, Psalms. This is an awe-inspiring prayer for David Amelik. It seems that he is sick in his body for somewhere around 13 years. And according to the sages, he says that they said that he felt that this was because of his sin with Bathsheba. Now, there is this debate within Jewish tradition that David technically did not sin, and therefore uh, the reason why he was not convicted of the law of, of adultery or whatever he did. He technically made past it, but in his eyes, he felt that his illness, that he was sick during this time of writing this, this prayer, had to do with penance, with had to do with rectifying something. And so we're going to see it in the prayer itself. You're going to notice how it unfolds, and you'll see it real quick. Now, once again, it starts in verse 1, for the conductor with instrumental music of the eight-string harp, a psalm of David. Now, first and foremost, right out of the chute, what gives us the impression that this psalm is different than any other psalm? And it's a really important question to ask. And it comes from this phrase, music for the eight-stringed harp. Just for a moment, what does eight represent in, in Hebrew and in the Jewish wisdom? Well, we know we have circumcision on the eighth day, right? And then when they built the temple, it says that and on the day, blah, 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 blah. So we understand that Jewish wisdom says that the eighth day is a day that stands out of time and space. It is uh, a day of divine connection. And so with that being said, the story starts off that this psalm is written for the instrument for an eight string harp or the eighth string. It's got an eighth string. It's got the extra string, which means that it's in the playing of this harp. He said that he hung that harp in his window. And so at around midnight to two in the morning, the the breeze would blow in. And if he heard the harp begin to uh, whistle with the air blowing through it, then he would get up. It was like an alarm clock. He knew that there was a divine connection getting ready to take place. And so if he would get up early in the morning, and when you see over and over in the psalm where it says, Early in the morning, I rise, blah, 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 blah. You, this is what it's talking about. So this idea is this eight-string harp is the harp of David, the music of a harp that was played in the temp- temple. And uh, there, is, uh, there is a soul stirring that takes place with the listening of music. Have you ever listened to music and uh, hear a song and you feel uh, like, uh, what do you call it? Goose pimples or you get, you know, little goose pimples all over your arm. Uh, they said not everybody experiences that. I thought everybody did, but not everybody does apparently. But it says that, uh, that, that people that are, that sense that their body responds to it. Now, everybody responds to music in some way or another, either they like it or they don't like it or a particular song, but music has a way of stirring up the, the, the nishama of a person. It goes on verse two, God, do not hold me with your anger, nor chastise me with your wrath. Be gracious to me, O God, for I am feeble. Heal me, O God, for my bones are shaking. My soul is utterly shaking by fear of death. Now you hear the great man of faith, David, saying that it is his fear of death. Now, what is he talking about here? David is not literally scared to die. He knows what lies ahead. But his concern was is that he had not finished his mission, that he still had many things he wanted to accomplish. And in his death, he's not going to be able to accomplish those. And we're going to see this in the text. Uh, let's go back, and we're going to look at a few details. Um, The uh, going back to the eighth day, I, I didn't mention this, but the eighth day, the psalm of the mitzvah of, refers to 
this eight is also of this psalm to the mitzvah of circumcision, the right that embodies our covenant with God, one that transcends reason and nature. The circumcision is performed on the eighth day after birth and Menachot 43b and was the eighth mitzvah given to mankind. Moreover, circumcision relates to the Psalms theme of healing since circumcision is in need of healing. So we see the parallels in that as well. Verse two, it says, do not scold me with your anger, nor chastise me with your wrath. David is saying. Castigation. Is beneficial. Discipline from Hashem is beneficial. However, David is very careful to say that if you're going to discipline me, let it not be with your anger and wrath. Midrash Tehillim. The Talmud teaches that whatever the merciful one does is for what? Good. Rachot 60b. Note, however, that the Talmud does not say that all that God does is good, since suffering and illness themselves are quite bitter, they are rather for good. They are a bitter pill and ultimately lead to sweetness. Now, the collective soul of the Jewish people, and I would even say the righteous, says before God, master of the world, although it is written that God scolds whom he loves or he chastens whom he uh, loves, Proverbs 3.12, nevertheless, do not scold me in your anger with an angry scolding. And although it is written, fortunate is the man who God chastens. Uh, nevertheless, do not chastise me with your wrath, with wrathful chastisement. You have upon whom to cast anger and wrath upon corrupt nations. As it is written, pour your wrath upon the nations at who do not acknowledge you. So David is saying, if you're going to pour out your wrath, don't pour it out on me. Please pour it out on the nations. We go to verse, uh, so that's two, three. Be gracious to me, O God, for I'm feeble. Heal me, O my God, my bones are shaken. My soul is utterly shaken by fear of death. And you, O God, until when you look on without healing me, how long is it going to be that I'm going to lay here in absolute misery and potential death? He was very concerned that he wasn't going to be healed. He was concerned that he would succumb to the, to the divine correction. He was very concerned about that. Uh, verse 4, the Jewish people can be compared to a man captured by criminals, each of whom strikes the captive in a different way. One criminal strikes him with his hand, the other with his fist, the other with a stone the other with a stick, until finally the man escapes, reaches home, falls down on the bed and cries, my bones, my bones, is in pain. Similarly, various nations subjugated the Jewish people with various sorts of harsh persecution. Then time comes to build the third temple. The Jewish people say, be gracious to me, O God, for I'm a feeble. Heal me, heal me O God, for my bones are shaken. It says, my soul is utterly shaken. And you, O oh God, until when? Like, how long is this going to last? David felt that the more suffering would lead to his death. He was concerned that he would physically not be able to withstand any more suffering. And we've known people who have died of uh, various diseases. And there comes a point where you just, you give up. You don't want to do a fight anymore. This is what David was concerned about. He begs God to spare his life since his soul had not completed his mission, but since they only sensed his, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, his bones and limbs also sensed that they had not fully utilized their performance to do mitzvahs. So deep down with inside David uh, is this idea that I, I have not finished the mitzvahs that I would like to do. Now, I will refer back to the Jewish people can be compared to a patient waiting for the day of a doctor only at the last moment, being sick all day, right at the doors, uh, the, uh, the door of death. And the doctor shows up right before sundown 
and provides a healing. And see in the plight of his people, David seems to be looking into the future of his own people, saying, as I have been afflicted, so will I, so do I see. Almost prophetically, they believe that this was a prophetic utterance talking about the suffering of the Jewish people throughout the ages. Um, basically, until when will the Jewish people have to wait for their healer? This is found in Midrash Tehillim. Verse 8, for I can make no rem remembrance of you in death and who praises you in the grave. Isn't this interesting? Does this seem a little prob problematic? Let's explore this for a second. It almost seems that he's saying that when I die, I go into some kind of sleep and I'm just a dead soul, dead corpse. This is not what it's saying. What it is saying is the only way that we can conduct the highest level of service to Hashem, of Oda Hashem, is by doing mitzvahs, by living a pious life. Well, if you're dead, your body can't do mitzvahs anymore. It cannot. So his point is this. Though the soul goes on and reaches to a higher level of divine connection, that person also has the ability to praise Hashem, to give praise to Hashem. But the difference is the praise there is adulation and praise that is, that is imagined. In the physical world, only thing that we do that counts the most is our mitzvahs, the physical things that we bring down or draw down uh, divine essence to the earth. Um, verse 7, I'm weary from, from, siding, uh, from sighing. Each night I drench my bed. I soak my couch with my tears. Wow, David is impacted so heavily by this. Many of us have been through these kinds of things. His, his, uh, it said that uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, commentary, it said that, uh, that his pillows and his bedding had to be changed several times a day, profuse sweating and tears. This is referring to the 13 years during which he was doing penance uh, because of Bathsheba. Verse 9, from me, all you evildoers for God has heard the sound of my weeping. The Talmud and Avodah Zarah 4b teaches that it was uncharacteristic of David of Melech who have committed the sin of Bathsheba. He was led to it by heaven in order to model repentance for others. Hence, in the verse, David says to those evildoers who feel that they have lost, uh, they are lost to God. He says, depart from sin through repentance. The proof that is it is possible, uh, the proof that this is possible comes from me. Look at my life in which I have demonstrated for God heard my cry and my weeping, and he will hear yours as well. What a great uh, a great thing to discover in our studies and people's prior uh, religious studies who teach them that there are sins that cannot be forgiven. Uh, there is no such thing in Judaism as that your sins cannot be forgiven or that there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. Every sin, every iniquity, every uh, thing is uh, everything done that is negative is broken down by serious contrition and humility before Hashem. It says the sound of his weeping. Let's look at this for a second, according to what the Zohar is saying. He said, one who cries in prayer and, and, and the stars and the planets cry along with him. And his prayers is heard on high. Prayer, prayer with tears does not go unanswered, according to the Zohar. While the child cries during the circumcision, those present, uh, present should pray for salvation from their own troubles. 
for this cry ascends to the highest without interference. We have heard people explain or describe uh, being in their worst of times physically and being terminally ill. They would say often, I've heard people say they felt like that God has abandoned them. And we know, according to Jewish wisdom, that God is actually closer to you when you're in that level of suffering. You may not feel like it, but Hashem most definitely is closer to you. Uh, the Midrash also relates this weeping to that of children, those whom Mordecai gathered for study and prayer. Hence, our verse says, depart from me, all you evildoers, i.e. Uh, human, for God has heard the sound of my weeping, the cries of the children whom Mordecai gathered through which Haman's decree was negated. Midrash Abba Gurion, uh, uh, it looks like section five. Tears today correspond to the water libations of the temple. I find that interesting. Verse 10, God has heard my supplication. God accepts my prayers. David said this either after he was healed or prophetically while he was ill. Let me ask you, does it matter? I think there's probably more power to declaring your healing before you're healed. There's, uh, there's something about being able to manifest the very thing that you are praying for. And it appears, well, obviously he gives praise to God for healing him, but we just don't know when this was. Verse 11, all my enemies will be ashamed, will be shamed and utterly shaken They, when they repent and be shamed for a moment. They will only be shamed during the time when they will come to make peace with me afterward, their previous behaviors will no longer be a source of shame for them since I will forgive them and never mention it again. Um, Rabbi Meir uh, Arama offers a different interpretation of the verse, underscoring the benefit of repentance. David says to his enemies, if you are too proud to repent, your lot in the end will be the one of shame and destruction. But if you humble yourself to repent, your shame will be but for a moment. It is better to suffer the shame of, uh, of repentance in that moment than to not repent and experience the consequences of that sin. Um, let me now give you six I'm going to give you uh, six contemporary lessons from Psalm 6. Six contemporary lessons from Psalm 6. Number one, even when we are going through hard times, we can take comfort in the knowledge that God will never forget us. God will never forget us. Verse 7. I think one of the most mysterious parts of Imuna is true biblical Imuna is not based on how I feel. It's based on what I embody and who I put my trust in. I may feel there are times that God has forgotten us, forgotten me in my past. I may have felt at times that I was abandoned in circumstances, but I look back, God's never abandoned me, never. He's never abandoned any one of you guys. And if you ever know someone who is struggling and feel like that they've been abandoned by God, and I know a couple of people that way, and it breaks my heart to have a conversation with them because they're truly broken people. They're broken, and they feel like, what's the use? Like. It's, it's terrible. Verse 7 is what affirms this idea that we take comfort in the knowledge that God will never forget us. How can God forget us? It would be like a mother forgetting a son or a father forgetting a daughter. It just will not happen. Number two, we should turn to God and seek his guidance, especially in the difficult times. Verse 8 
is the verse that would give us this understanding. It is important that we turn to God and seek his guidance at all times. But especially in the most difficult time, it's not hypocritical to say, well, you know, I haven't turned to you a lot and asked you a lot of other wisdom, but at this point, I need you terribly. It's not hypocritical. You just need to do it. That just demonstrates your faith. Number three, we should keep in mind that God is able to forgive any sin and turn it into something which is beneficial. That's found in verse eight. Now, what, what am I saying when I talk about turn it into something beneficial? Well, First, there is this idea that your sin, when you uh, repent, that you're actually turning that into a mitzvah. You're turning it into something positive. You took something that was very negative, and you allowed that to draw you close to the heart of the creator of the universe, and you've repented. You've returned to the status of being connected to God. You've returned yourself to Hashem. And so, we got to keep this in mind that there isn't a sin that God will not forgive. All we have to do is turn ourselves to him, uh, to, to Hashem, and he will bring us a tremendous amount of rescue. Number four, it is always important to remember to give God the glory and praise that is due him. I've found myself doing this several times throughout my life. Like whenever something happens that is really positive, what do we normally say? Ah, broke a shell. Praise God. All right. Always when something good happens, that makes sense. And that's good. But have we learned to say that when things are bad? <laughs> See, this is the whole point. This is like the secret message of King David. In the worst of times, you obviously are going to cry out. It's easy to say thank you, Hashem, when things are positive and good. But can we have enough imuna to say, I'm going through this financial struggle. Uh, I'm going through this health problem. I'm going through this relational issue in my family. You know what? There's some benefit here. I don't know what it is. But God, I know that you can make a positive out of this very negative circumstances circumstance. So we begin to thank him for it. That is an attitude of gratitude that goes so long to changing. There is a, a sort of a psychological trick that I was, I was reading the effect in a magazine talking about uh, getting people to wake up. And there's a mantra that they go through every morning when they wake up and it's about gratitude, right? And they, they start off, it's, I think it's like 30 days or 40 days of gratitude. You get up every morning and the first day that you do it, you're grateful, have gratitude for the smallest things. It doesn't matter. Just list out the things that you have gratitude for. And as you go along, you uh, begin to practice this, this meditation of being grateful and, and having uh, a gratitude to the place that you start finding and discovering things that you should be great, grateful for, but have not connected to it. You just... We assume that things should go a certain way, but we should be grateful and everything. It talks about how it completely re uh, reprograms a person's outlook by the sense of gratitude. And we all are products of that, and we know this. Number five, God will always be with us in our sorrows and our times of suffering. Verse 11, he's never going to abandon, abandon us or forsake us. Number six, it is important for us to always rely on God, even when it doesn't seem possible. There are those of us who, who have in our past struggled with Amuna because we felt like that we had to be at a certain level of spirituality to uh, have that kind of Amuna and to trust God no matter what. Uh, but after practicing it, for a while, you guys have discovered that there's something to hanging and trusting God. Just there's something to it. And there's something incredible when we read the writings of King David and realize that his story, his, his history, his background demonstrates that in this contemporary environment, we are still connected just as he was. He was a human being. He was, though the king of Israel, a very righteous man, 
He also struggled with the depths of struggle that we struggle with as human beings. That concludes the, the lesson. So why don't we get into discussion now?